What's poppin' everybody? Episode 31 of the Slip and Weave Podcast coming at you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Ryan Garcia and Luke Campbell and a very interesting co-main event between Rene Alvarado and Roger Gutierrez. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the landscape of boxing in this early part of 2021. Let's get it. the ability to adjust um, and he had to show the ability to outthink a very smart fighter that knew what he was doing and um, overall I think it was a really exciting performance from Ryan Garcia in kind of like an unexpected way but uh, before I start talking about that I want to talk about Roger Gutierrez winning a unanimous decision over Rene Alvarado obviously neither of these guys are huge names but Alvarado had a belt um, and Gutierrez, I had seen upset, you know, a young prospect that was undefeated and he had knocked that guy out. So I thought it was interesting that he was in title position. Um, and all three scores, 113, 112 across the board, uh, because Gutierrez was able to score three knockdowns throughout the fight. So truth be told, all three judges saw Alvarado winning more rounds um, then Gutierrez, but the knockdowns ultimately are what make the difference. And actually, the knockdown that he had in the twelfth round is the difference between a win and a draw. If he doesn't get that knockdown, even if he wins the round, seven five with two knockdowns is one thirteen, one thirteen across the board. So, what was interesting was Alvarado's style generally is more well put together. He's more technically sound. He's more consistent in what he does. Gutierrez has lulls and he has periods where he holds a lot and he has periods where he kind of just backs straight up across the ring. Like, I don't know if he switches off or it's just that's how he gets air or whatever, or he was saving, a you know, sort of a last volley for the end of the fight. But, you know, overall, Alvarado was more consistent in what he was doing, but there was something about Gutierrez's timing You know, when he caught him in that third round. So he drops him twice in the third round. Completely changes the the landscape of the fight. But by the middle rounds, it actually kind of seems like Alvarado is bullying him around a bit. You know, I would say by the fifth or sixth round, he's sort of pushing Gutierrez around. And my thinking was that, all right, he's going to have won enough rounds down the stretch here. Going into the 12th, this is what I'm thinking, that he's going to be able to, like, win a decision. Because he's just been winning, you know, five, six, seven rounds in a row. And then he gets dropped again in the 12th round. So as much as on the whole, it felt like Alvarado fought a better, smarter, more consistent fight. I think that Gutierrez was very clutch in the 12th round. And the the first five rounds of the fight, you know, were very 50-50 give him those two knockdowns you know three knockdowns is difficult to overcome you literally do have to win eight rounds then to get a decision if you get dropped three times um so it does make it very difficult and ultimately those are the the moments of the fight that decided the decision literally so i think that was a very exciting win for gutierrez i know these guys are at featherweight i don't know of the elite level featherweights who gutierrez can compete with but if this was a rematch of a fight that Alvarado previously won, I would love to see a third fight. Why don't we get a third fight out of this one? These guys are clearly a fun matchup. You know, they 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 have a, a, a good mesh of styles. They, their styles mix well. So I don't see any reason not to do a third fight. I think it would be a great co-main event in really any card. And, um, and maybe the main event of a smaller, you know, bubble type card. Um, so yeah, I, that was a lot of fun. It was a great way to, uh, to hype up the main event. And then, you know, going into the main event, 
um, Ryan Garcia and Luke Campbell, I thought that it was interesting because you could see early in the fight that Garcia had never really fought anybody at this level, particularly. He had he had fought some talented dudes and he had fought some guys, but at the end of the day, he hasn't really, before this, like fought anybody that tested him mentally and physically in this kind of way. You know, what I noticed early was that as far as boxing tactics, you know, Campbell was actually winning some of those early rounds with his, you know, he was, but he was also winning the small battles. He was getting his front foot on the outside. He was punching Ryan at some weird angles. And particularly in the first round and a half, he was countering with his left hand to the body very well, very consistently, super accurate. Um, and it kind of looked a little bit like Ryan was a little bit out of his depth. I mean, he was throwing nice shots and whatever, but there wasn't much landing. And then, of course, like towards the end of the second round, Campbell drops Garcia. And it was so funny, man, because the commentators are so hot and cold on these guys. Like the minute he went down, is they're like, is he the goods? You know, can he deliver? Like they're immediately just like writing him off. Um, but what was great was that like by the end of the second round, he was coming forward. And I don't think Campbell pressed that moment as much as he could have. I think on one hand, there's the, the, the smarts of it, right? Like, all right, I got this one. The kid doesn't look that hurt. He's still dangerous. Like, let me be smart. Let me be practical. But there's also like those moments don't always come. So if you don't, if you don't really press that moment and see where he's at, you know, it's like he didn't he he settled for I got a 10-8 round in a sense. I didn't feel like he really went after him. And then on top of that, Ryan landed a really hard left hook to the body, like kind of at the end of the second round, and I noticed that slowed Campbell's pace down a bit. You know, and then I felt like as a whole, I don't have my score in front of me, but you know, I felt like as a whole, the third and the fourth were pretty close. The fifth was pretty close as a whole as well. And then Garcia, like, really stuns Campbell at the end of the fifth. You know, literally, like, on the bell, he's, like, turning his back. And uh, and that was probably the turning point of the fight, or at least the tone of the fight, where, you know, it's a chess match. It's pretty 50-50. Maybe Ryan's edging the rounds, some of the rounds on activity. But the, in my opinion, the, the overall, the cleaner shots are coming from Campbell. But that moment really kind of changed the dynamic of the fight. And then the beginning of the sixth, you know, he's just ripping combinations. Um, and it was funny in the seventh round, right before he drops Campbell with the body shot, Campbell actually hits Garcia with a pretty hard body shot. And you could see that was like the answer to it. But the thing was, Campbell had his right glove up so high, like up here, trying, you know, waiting for that left hook that his whole body was exposed and he just sort of was wide open for it in that moment. I mean, there, there he wasn't defending for that shot in, at all. So he probably didn't see it coming. And then once it dropped him, you know, he was done. You could see it. You could see his legs were fucking done that, it, you know, I know he got up at the end, but it was just like, there wasn't, I, at least I thought there wasn't any way that he was going to be able to keep Garcia off of him. It was a matter of time. You know, the shot landed so perfectly. And I think it's very clear that, Gar you know, Ryan Garcia's got nice, some nice punching power. You know, he's a legitimate power puncher now. And I don't know. I think that there were, there were some things that we learned about his game from this fight, good and bad. I think the good is he just, he showed that he's a real fighter, man. He got dropped. He showed a heart and a chin and got up. And by the end of the round, he was coming forward. You know, and that's what you want to see from a young fighter. Particularly one that is being spoken about in this high, in these high praises, the way the zone talks about him. And so that part was really dope. You know, he took the shot. He got up. He kept coming forward. You know, he started stepping on Campbell's foot or at times winning the front foot on the outside battle. You know, and he... He also showed a certain level of class because he was able to get Campbell on the ropes and throw nice combinations. And he was actually, like from the fifth round on, 
did a really nice job cutting the ring off and actually started moving his upper body a little bit to avoid punches. Um, but the, I, I think it was, it was cool to watch him kind of get that education though, because the first couple of rounds you could see he was like, I don't want to say lost, but he wasn't used to having to be that switched on or that engaged. Like it's, it's been so easy for him because of the opponents that he's been fighting and because he's talented, but because of the opponents he's been fighting, you know, it's been easy to walk through all these dudes. And then he's coming at this with that same attitude and he gets caught because Campbell's been throwing the left of the body and he goes to parry like he's going to block a body shot and he gets caught on the side. And I think what that shows is that defensively, he's got some things he's got to work on, right? His, he's very kind of chin up in the air. You know, he kind of walks casual, forward casually with that front hand down. He's kind of, he, you know, his chin is there to be hit. And a lot of times, too, when you start throwing at him, he backs straight up. So if you can follow that up and maintain your position, you know, he's moving back. You can catch him. Um, so, he, like, and, and to be honest with you, his main defense is just sort of bouncing backward and getting away from you. He doesn't do a lot of head movement. Right, he doesn't have a lot of like, he doesn't catch shots with his gloves instinctually, like that's not that's not his instinct. Right now, and maybe that's just because he's got to keep fighting better guys. But right now, his instinct is to come forward with his hands kind of low. So, you know, bigger punches is going to be able to take advantage of that in a in a serious way. You know what I'm saying? Like if he takes the kind of shots he took from Luke Campbell from. Tiafimo Lopez, from Javante Davis, from Lomachenko, from Devin Haney, you know, I think that they're going to affect him even more. So on one hand, it's like he showed that he's a real fighter. He showed some real balls. He showed that some grit, you know what I mean? He showed some real grit and some adaptability. But at this, it's also too, like, if he doesn't make these adjustments, these defensive adjustments, if he doesn't learn how to fight on angles more and learn how to, like Canelo, how to move your upper body and and move your head to create offense. Um, You know, as he moves up, he's going to continue to have more complications like that. You know, guys that are... Another guy that they were talking about him fighting a few months ago was Jorge Linares. You know, to be fair, Linares has much faster hands than Luke Campbell. You know, Campbell's got nice speed, but Linares is a very fast, twitchy combination puncher you know if he's leaving his chin out like that when he punches i think that lenares would would have the speed and the coordination and the technique to catch him and kind of fuck him up that i'm not saying that he could beat him but i'm saying somebody like that when you when you keep moving up levels you know guys are going to present even more challenges so if your game is not buttoned up like they'll expose that you know what i'm saying but I want to. I actually would like to see the Linares fight. I would really like to see. And I talked about this episodes ago, when they were actually trying to make the fight. But I think that, first of all, Linares also beat Luke Campbell by decision. He also dropped Luke Campbell, and there was a time where Linares was Ryan Garcia. He was kind of like the young prospect that was. I mean, not in the same level of fame because it was a different time before social media and shit, but. Like 10 years ago, Linares was a Ryan Garcia type. And what he's actually shown is great skill, but at the same time, a certain level of vulnerability to, to, being, uh, to being caught and to being a little chinny. But he's also shown resilience to keep coming back and to keep winning at a high level. And I think he's got the right level of ex- experience and and speed and combination punching to give Ryan Garcia stylistically a lot of problems and 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 if he does win I think it'll be like this kind of fight where he comes out of it with some real lessons and he comes out of it a better fighter so that that's actually what I would hope for for him next would be uh, a fight with Jorge Linares hopefully we get to see that at some point um the last thing I want to talk about you know I've seen recently that the british board of boxing control i think that's what it's called has banned boxing in the uk for i think the month of january and 
that amongst you know a lot of other things as you'll notice this first part of 2021 the schedule is not as booked up as it's been the last six seven months you know since june and the top rank bubble um i think that there is a lot of reasons for that i think something like a boxing governing body you know shutting down the sport in an area for a period of time will have an effect on it right there's a lot of big fights in england there's a lot of fights in england period that are on television so if they're not able to put cards on that's going to cut the schedule back i think that it's very possible that other commissions in many places and potentially in the united states will start doing this we'll start mirroring this as the as the pandemic gets worse i do think that there's going to be more um short-term boxing bans that are going to make it difficult to to make fights in a in a short-term way and i think that there's a lot there's a lot of reasons for that obviously but you know we've seen crowds here in the states mostly in texas at fights i believe this fight was in miami florida and it had fewer people there but you know boxing is doing crowds right now for the big fights not necessarily for any other fight that there's no crowds it's not worth the risk but in in texas and and in florida we're seeing that people are willing to take those risks you know they're not they're willing to say yeah we'll put all these people in here and you know and i also have seen a lot of like video on social media and on youtube of people going to after parties at these things and you know people hanging out at media events and just like there's a lot of contact going on in boxing right now like and what i'm curious is if people were getting sick from these events who would say that like who would report that who would talk about that i don't know who would talk about it cuz you know the athletic commission's not going to talk about it cuz they want to portray that they're putting on a safe event the media is not going to talk about it because their business is having events to cover i don't think the people that go would necessarily know that they got it there even though it would seem relatively obvious they might be just out and about anyway and so it's like i couldn't pinpoint where i got it so it would just be it would be there would be very few sources i believe that would would talk about that openly and say look you know we've had a couple of cases here maybe we need to do i think all of that is like i think we're in the wild west now where you make the choice to go to one of these events and that shit's on you you basically sign a waiver and it's like if you get it you get it and i don't know if there's ndas or whatever i'm not a conspiracy guy but i'm just saying there doesn't seem to be anything in place that would say, look, you know, there are people getting sick from these events and we need to be very careful. Um, and when you see all these after parties and there's nobody wearing masks and there's nobody fucking distant, doing any kind of distancing of any kind, it's like these are the kind of places where people are going to get this thing. So it's like, are has, is boxing becoming almost like you know uh a really well sponsored super spreader event you know because it just seems like the sport is putting itself in a really difficult position to succeed right now it seems like this is only a short term plan there's no long term plan here the plan is to just get money where you can get it how you can get it and i'm telling you that will backfire at some point i couldn't tell you how but it's going to get harder to put these fights on, I, I believe, in 21. Until, you know, the vaccine is more widespread and the case numbers are down and whatever. But for the time being, I got to be honest. I think we're in a weird spot, man. And I think it's a big part of why you don't see more fights getting announced right now. Because there are some. Don't get me wrong. There are some. And there's always a lull at the beginning of the year. But you can't tell me that the uncertainty of the situation and the money... You know, and 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 certain places' lack of desire to hold these events 
it it, it's, it has an impact. There's no way around it. So, anyways, that's my thoughts on that. You know, it's it's a weird fucking tricky time, and you know, I hope we can continue to put on fights safely in 21 as much as possible, and I hope as much as possible we can do it in a bubble and in a safe way and in a way where. You know, we can know that the athletes and the trainers and everybody involved is completely safe and that the fights are not in some way like a danger to the public. You know what I mean? So uh, that's episode 31 of the Slip Point Podcast, you guys. Thanks so much for listening, as always, and I will catch you next week. Peace.